Hello there, uh, my name is Jason Luttrell, and um, I would really love to give a big shout out and thank you to the Global Bar Week, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, specifically, the uh, BCB team for organizing this event, and um, a special thanks to um, Angus Winchester for the invitation. Um, this is a, a big honor for me, and I, and I very much appreciate it. So, hello world, uh, welcome to Global Bar Week. Um, so this talk is about, um, you know, I'll give you a little bit about myself. So for years, I was a bartender at dives, music venues, nightclubs, um, and uh, eventually I stumbled my way into um, a couple of world-class cocktail bars, inclu including Dram and Death and & Company, among others. Um, most of the bars I worked at were pretty divey. Um, so eventually I started my own business, and I noticed that there were some parallels between building cocktail rounds and um, organizing my consultancy and subsequently how I organized my life. And so that's what I wanted to talk about. So um, my decade behind the bar uh, was some of the most important years of my life as far as you know, developing the philosophy that we're gonna discuss today. Um, no, I try not to get too heady about this stuff, but um, it really has impacted the way my, I operate on a day-to-day -day basis. So as much as I would love to take credit for this original thought, um, this is nothing more than a connection of wisdom from mentors and heroes uh, that I've worked with over the years, including Alex Day, um, the writings of Jim Meehan, and um, the legend, Mr. Sasha Petrasky. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that, I'm, I'm not trying to call out these people like, a, like, I'm, uh, like I'm a star fucker or something like that, but it's, uh, you know, these people really helped me a lot. So um, these guys were just students of efficiency and they were help, you know, like instrumental in helping me understand and apply the, these, uh, applying these principles to my life and um, definitely to my business as well. Uh, so just I want to set the stage for you. So imagine you're getting ready for a dinner rush and you have to squeeze um, and you get a daiquiri and a ward eight. Can you imagine making that fresh grenadine for yourself or can you imagine squeezing the lime juice? Um, you know you wouldn't because everybody would be tapping their fingers saying, where is my drink? Uh, and this would be a complete disaster, right? Uh, it would be a massive, massive fail. So um, today we're gonna talk about the powerful connection between organizing your bar and your life through the metaphor of building cocktail rounds. Um, a lot of this stuff is based on an article I wrote uh, for my own website, uh, March of 2019. Um, but since, since then, um, it's kind of evolved a lot and I've, I've, I've meased the hell out of my business. So, um, how do we ruthlessly organize our lives in a way that we can protect our mise and plus like, um, just the day to day stuff. So what would be the point of that? Um, in my opinion, uh, the art of building rounds is the highest level of mastery that a bartender can achieve. Uh, it's, it, it connects all the different disciplines, uh, that, that you look for in a great bartender. Um, you know, it's a mastery of your ingredients, I mean, you know, knowing where everything is, knowing what's in everything. Um, it's a mastery of how to put those together um, and mastery of the cocktails that you're producing with them. Uh, more so for me, it's a mastery of your space. Um, and it's an under and I, and I believe that this is a, a, the most understated way to express a mastery of hospitality is by, you know, guests don't want the labor pain. They just want the baby. Uh, so when you have all these elements effortlessly under control, uh, you're able to create a relaxing and entertaining environment for your guests. There's no stress. Uh, you, uh, you know, you're in this kind of mental flow state and um, this is, a, a, there's, no, there, there's no anxiety about the, all the tickets coming in, there's just flow. And this is what, this is what uh, truly stands out for me um, to win, win the world's great bars. So as we all understand, uh, there's a logic to uh, a cocktail. So each, um, each ingredient has a symbiotic relationship with the other ingredients. Um, you know, uh, in, mo in, in the case of most shaken cocktails, we have sugars, acids, and bases, and they all work together to create a, um, a balance. Now, building, building rounds honors that balance and um, composure and seeks to um, execute that and several other drinks like it very quickly, quickly, mindfully, and with um, a sort of effortless intensity. So mise en place is the beating heart of building rounds. Um, everything has to be in its, everything has a place and everything has to be in its place. Um, and uh, you know, the more complex your bar, your, your, your cocktail menu is, the, the more complex your space is gonna be. And there's gonna be a lot of moving parts. There's gonna be things that you run out of, you know. Um, and so it's imperative to keep this space uh, neat, tidy, and most, uh, and 
organized, topped up, and absolutely ready for anything. There is no taking a break when you're in service because you're if you're not preparing for right now, then you're preparing for tomorrow. So nothing can destroy a flow like endless, like like picking up empty, sticky, or misplaced, mislabeled bottles. Uh, it's just I remember being very, very frustrated by that sometimes. Um, you know, the conscientious placement of your tools. Um, is the difference between a good round and a, and a complete breakdown of your workflow. Um, grouping your tools and ingredients together in a way that creates a linear movement um, and also in a logical order for, say, what if, it were, if they appear together in a menu item, um, is uh, so, creating, uh, so creating a linear movement and ergonomic efficiency is the path to not only making drinks faster, but it will also lengthen your career. Now think about it, if you're you know, using your right hand and, and crossing over, um, you know, uh, that creates a rigid and ineff inefficient movement and it leads to strains, aches, pains, and tension. Um, so also on, a, on another note, I'm not exactly a spiritual person, but I do believe that um, a drink made with happy hands and a happy heart makes a drink taste better. Um, and I got, um, that's not, an, I remember this um, seminar that uh, Dushan Zarek, um, Aisha Sharp, and of course the master Gary Regan used to go, uh, used to give about the mindfulness of bartending. I absolutely believe that happy rice, angry rice, that whole thing, remember that? Um, so positivity is contagious um, and it can uh, absolutely affect the, t the tone of a room. Okay, so we're gonna start getting into some very specific parts about, um, about building rounds. And um, specifically now we're gonna talk about protecting, what I call protecting your mees, uh, making sure that no outside influence can, um, uh, can, can uh, impact it. So periodically through the shift, um, you try to be mindful about what you have available to you at all times. And whatever can't fit in the well or surrounding service area should be backed up and handy, uh, that, you know, regardless of what's on the menu. If it's about what people order, not what's on the menu. So this goes for all spirits, juices, mixers, garnish, service items, um, napkins, uh, straws, um, whatever. Uh, everything needs to be uh, stocked up and, and ready, uh, very handily available. So this isn't your barback's job. Uh, this is your job. Uh, if you have a barback, teach them your job and then uh, teach them how to anticipate. They will make epic bartenders when it is their time. So the great barbacks know the cocktails as well as the bartenders do. Now let's talk about pivoting. Now I'm not talking about COVID pivoting. I'm talking about like actually pivoting in the cockpit of your, of your workstation. So um, you want to set up your well like it's, a, like it's a cockpit of an airplane and you're about to uh, go fly. So everything you'll notice is in a very small space. It's, very, it's right around there. So everything you need should be within one step of your primary spot. And one of your feet should be able to grow roots in that spot. And then that one foot doesn't move. And then every, everything else around you, you just kind of move pivot from one spot. So um, if, if, the hits, if it hits the fan, um, you know, a single com commonly used bottle will um, be there with just a single pivot of the foot. Now let's talk about tool efficiency. Now, uh, using tools more than once is, is a great way to trim seconds off your, if you're, off your build time, but it isn't like monkey knife fighting. Uh, there are rules. Um, now keep in mind, these rules don't supersede the cheap stuff first rule. That means you, you always pour the smallest amount or the cheapest stuff first. So um, when it becomes impossible to follow these rules, um, discard the tool and just use a new one. Uh, you should have plenty of backup tools. Um, the idea is to constantly uh, maintain a state of readiness. And by discard, I mean um, set aside to be washed um, when the round is fully executed. Um, so you set it, throw it in the water, uh, be done with it. Um, so here we go. So sugars, um, it is the it is absolutely fine to use the same tool, um, to, whether it's a teaspoon um, or a jigger, um, low, low intensity to high. Pour the thin stuff like the one-to-one -one simple syrup first. Um, these ingredients always tend to be the cheapest as well. Uh, so that follows the cheap stuff first rule. Now, as you get into denser syrups like uh, maple syrup, honey, agave, um, you know, more fluid will actually stick to the walls of the tool and the measurement will be impacted, you know, over time. Uh, and, you know, thus it will be slightly less accurate. So not a lot of people would actually notice that, but you would. Um, uh, and neutral flavors, uh, you know, when we're talking about spirits, uh, neutral, uh, neutral flavors go first. And you start with unflavored syrups and then move on to more aggressive flavors like s cinnamon or maraschino or uh, kumal or whatever it is. Um, and then that weird pineapple gas streak that you've been working on. Now that, bring, that brings us into, um, into acids. Now acids are typically mean um, press, fresh pressed juice. And I would consider like vinegars, shrubs, uh, and citrates to be a whole different thing. So I, they probably get their own jigger. But um, you wanna pour these last so the other jigger can uh, just to be safe with the other jigger. So low volume to high volume. Uh, if it's gonna be a quarter of an ounce of in one drink, get it out of the way. 
Um, and uh, this usually works itself out as there's rarely more than two fresh acids in a drink. So some people make a wort, if you're talking about the wort eight, some people make a wort eight with both lemon and lime juice. That's the same jigger drink. Um, so uh, hard acids like lemon, lime, grapefruit, uh, they can share a jigger without being washed in between, in my opinion. Um, the residual liquid from the last pour is negligible and is imperceptible, to, has an imperceptible impact on the flavor of the cocktail. Um, lemon and lime being the most prevalent acids, uh, maybe ask yourself before putting in the, uh, put in, before putting the bottle back, um, you know, if you have a larger round, then chances are you're going to need lemon and lime again. Are you, before you put it back, say, can I use this lime again? Because, uh, you know, that, that otherwise you have to pick up the bottle twice, and that's very inefficient. Um, so um, when I'm talking about spirit base, so, so um, typically anything 80 proof or higher is what I mean by spirit base or the predominant ingredient, ingredient base of the cocktail if there is one. So like the orange Julius cocktail has curacao as a base, for instance. Um, neutral flavors always come first. So that means your vodkas. Uh, anything can go after vodka. Um, by its nature and by an antiquated American definition, it's flavorless and odorless. In fact, um, measuring vodka will likely leave your measuring, your measuring tool cleaner than it was before. Now, I rarely cleaned our tools after they'd handle vodka uh, because they were probably cleaner than the water we used to wash it. <laughs> so if the components are the same drink, uh, there's no need to rinse the jigger in my opinion. Uh, there's really um, very little covalent bonding that, uh, with that much alcohol, with that high proof of alcohol. Liqueurs are obviously different, but uh, with most of it, le will le will leave the jigger when you pour it out, unlike a denser syrup, for instance. So it's not necessary to switch tools between like category spirit spirits within reason. Um, we'll go into that right now. So uh, switching from one bourbon or rye to another bourbon or rye is probably not necessary to change your tool. Um, I wouldn't know the difference. Uh, not that I have this magical palette or anything. Um, but um, switching between a blended scotch to an Isla scotch would uh, would probably um, leave a discernible measure. So you wouldn't put those use that same jigger for two different drinks in, in that instance. Um, so uh, good spirits uh, deserve respect, and always assume your guest has a palate that can discern the difference. So you know, in this case, a, a maybe is typically a no. Don't take the risk because you know you could ruin one or both of the drinks. Um, so when you're switching from spirit categories, like uh, from gin to tequila or rum to a, sim to a similar style of rum, then it's okay to use the same tool for the same drink. It's always, I mean, if, it's, if you have one drink and you're just making one drink, then, then the tool, one tool can go um, into, like one tool can be used for the entire drink, obviously. Um, so uh, let's talk about the ballet. So if, you're, um, if your mise is really tight, um, you shouldn't be crossing over to other bartenders. And I'm making a few assumptions here. Um, uh, so every, every bar is unique. Uh, and it has its own benefits and drawbacks. Um, like in New York, for instance, the most, of the, most of the infrastructures are built hundreds of years ago. So we kind of, a lot of times you can kind of get what you get as far as plumbing and, and, and drainage and stuff like that. Um, so we have to build the bars around the existing infrastructure in most cases. Um, also, it's important to note in the States, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which means that most new constructions have to be accessible by wheelchair. Uh, so some, if, you're in, if you're in Europe, um, you, I'm not sure how that works as far as grandfathering in um, uh, new architecture, but uh, for us it's kind of interesting because sometimes you can see a bar that you can land a jumbo jet behind. Um, so once I, once I built a, a bar with, that I had, had a mise that I had, with a bar that had uh, a length that accommodated six bar seats but had to serve 120 people on the floor. Now with two bartenders, we were climbing all over each other all night. And that was a bar called Jaybird. That was my first consulting project. Um, it later became seamstress. Uh, so this, um, th this will be obvious to most of you, but when working in a really tight space, it's, it's in extremely important that you never violate the other space without announcing your presence. Uh, now by announcing, it doesn't have to be like, hey, I'm here. Um, but it, def it absolutely can be a safety issue because you know, if there's you know, water on the floor, you know, you know, glass in your hand, um, for me, this usually comes in the form of a verbal behind you, um, but um, at, at one place we developed a, um, a system of kind of general, generally tapping each other, um, and that was, uh, that was very effective for us because we weren't burdening the guest uh, with our internal communication. Now, the idea is that we made, uh, made it as effortless as possible for them to enjoy their drinks without hearing us, without, without hearing our chatter. Um, they, you know, again, they didn't want the leaving us without, without hearing our chatter. Um, they, you know, again, they didn't want the labor pain. They just wanted the baby. 
Um, so, you know, this is a, with, when we're talking about efficiently building rounds, it's very, very important to have good communication with your, with your co-bartender. So um, there, there's a reinforced physical dialogue that helps us sync up with eye contact and peripheral vision. And also, it, you know, it's, it was also very good team building and it made the, the post shift beers taste a lot better. So it really felt like we were a unit and this was a very, um, very efficient way to work. So when I worked at Death & Company, um, we had some 75 or 80 smaller cheater bottles. So rather than having a full 750 mil on the bar, we had cheater bottles that were shared between the bartenders. Um, knowing those guys, there's probably hundreds now. They love their cheater bottles. Um, so uh, I'm pretty sure they, they, they designed the, the menus just to, to watch me knock over these little tiny bottles. Um, so when I was working there, it was 95% menu cocktails and the classics were being served. And they were, we're talking about 50, 60 cocktails on a menu that rotated three or four times a year. So, um, you know, five, the other 5% was like gin and tonics and beer and wine. Um, so the service, uh, to service uh, this, to, to service this menu, the bar was split into two and the point bartender would service all the guests at the bar, 12 seats, including handling cash. And the service bartender would, um, and the service bartender would serve the servers and roughly 40, 50 guests. Um, so uh, the point well was designed around executing the items used most, um, like as in the menu. Um, and then not necessarily around what we thought the standard bar order would be most bars. Um, so, you, you know, we, the efficiency was in being, having our tools ready for us in context. So the service bartender has a much larger well because the likelihood of, of the 40 to 50 guests at tables um, to order some sort of a classic or previous menu item was relatively high. That is in, in, in addition to any classic cocktail that you can think of. So the point was our, our wells were not the same. So when the, so the, so when the point bartender needed something, he had to, uh, we had to communicate to avoid crossing over. Now, this was, a, this was the most efficient path. Um, uh, when, when we were done with it, it was, it was immediately placed uh, in a commonly agreed place and returned to its labeled and its right spot immediately because in the next five seconds, I could possibly need it. So protecting your Mies is like vitally important because you know if you can't find a tool, then you, it just interrupts your flow. So if you're not relying on an anecdotal evidence to set up your Mies efficiently, look at your sales, look at your POS and find out what your, what your product mix is. Uh, if your product mix has a certain spirits ranking higher than other things, like say vodka sodas, um, then make sure that those bottles are both displayed on the back bar and in the well where both bartenders can, can reach it without turning their back to guests. Now, um, uh, the, I'll just assume that all bars uh, have only two wells and two bartenders. That's like every bar, right? Every single bar in the world is that, right? Okay. Um, so if you're constantly going to the back bar to grab that same bottle of premium scotch, then it should be living in your well. Uh, you know, even if the label gets banged up in the well, that's fine because there, you got the pretty one in the back bar. Um, you can still keep it up there and make sure that the guests are, are aware of it and that and put it on your scotch list. But there can be a banged up bottle in your well because you know it's going to sell. And, um, and this is about efficiency and efficiency leads to speed and speed leads to more money. Um, uh, more money is a byproduct of happier guests. So, um, all right, let's move on to ice. Now, ice is, um, you know, we've, we've, we've had our ice obsession for years now. So regardless of the, of uh, your jigger pour, if you, if you pour out of the bottle or if your store pours or from a gasoline pump, uh, the same rules apply. Um, always start with the cheap stuff and ice always comes last. Uh, I've never really understood why people um, have a hard time with this unless you're timing it out, but, um, ice should come last because it's like an ingredient that, that deteriorates. So ice always comes last when building individual drinks. And this should only be done when the drinks are in the round are, are completely built. So all of the liquid is, is mixed together in, in, the, in the tin or the mixing glass. And then you add the ice because that's when the clock is, um, is ticking. It's like baking. Uh, once it's in the oven, it starts to cook, right? So um, once you add the ice, it starts to chill. It starts to dilute your drink. And so this can be timed. This can be um, put together conscientiously. So in order to have more control over temperature and dilution, Save the ice for last unless you're sp uh, specifically timing for that round. Uh, and that's, you know, very rare occasions. But, you know, generally speaking, going from big ice to little ice will help you um, control the, the, the different rates of dilution for the different kinds of ice. And I'm talking about like, you know, big blocks. Um, it, like if you're shaking with big blocks or if you only use those for prestige or where you're actually delivering the drinks. Or if you're shaking with Hoshizaki or cold draft cubes, that is going to be a different kind of shake and different amount of time. Um, maybe you're shaking with shell ice or shit ice, as we call it in the States. Uh, maybe you're shaking with pellet ice. Um, you know, um, you know, 
there's different drinks have different preparations and, and they, they lead to different textures. So you want to be mindful of all this. So when you're preparing drinks, it's vitally important to not begin um, the dilution portion until the round is synced up, until you're ready to um, fire everything in sequence. Um, so up until the ice point, you can verify that you've got all the ingredients measured correctly and make sure that, that any adjustments necessary before the clock starts, to, uh, that you've made any adjustments necessary before the clock starts ticking. Um, it's worth it to take a moment to get, uh, to get this straight in your head. This is a very good time to taste while, you're, uh, while your drinks are in the tins and they're not uh, delivered in the cocktail glass. I really hate seeing people taste drinks when they're actually just about to go out to the guests. That looks very gross. Uh, so when finishing or presenting your drinks, um, here's an order that I think might help get them out as fresh as possible. And hopefully we'll have a transcript so you guys don't have to write all this stuff down. But um, a benchmark for me uh, is having really dry ice, as in that there's, the ice hasn't melted yet and you can see the dryness of it. Like literally the ice has a matte finish and hasn't started sweating yet. Uh, that's what I would consider like a really fresh presentation. So now the presentation order. Um, so I would serve drinks first in this order, like large cubes first, then call in spears, uh, then cold draft and hoshizaki cubes. Um, then drinks that are served up, and then drinks that are served on pellet ice, and then uh, shaved ice. Now, the, uh, you know, when, so we've talked, like, the ice and the ingredients, and now let's talk about technique. Um, so let's talk about shaking. Shaking is, is an often underestimated element of technique, um, but every shake is completely unique. So by far, um, the most violent of all our emotions, uh, this is, uh, this, but it can also be um, graceful and meaningful. So shaking, as we know, is a way to influence the temperature and texture and dilution. Now, temperature, texture, and dilution. So we have one job, putting the drinks together in, in a way that, that, and delivering them with great temperature, texture, and dilution. So these three elements are the vital components of preparing any drink, whether they're cold, room temperature, fizzy, neat, served up or on the rocks, or strained into your cupped hand, it doesn't matter. Um, shaken drinks are typically served to la um, uh, serve last to retain as much life as possible. Um, now, life um, is what we understand to be like that kind of effervescent um, interaction of air, liquid, and ice and force um, commingling um, and uh, you know forming and reforming to create this kind of bubbly feature. So it's it's like effervescence. It, it tickles your nose if you get it right. Um, so you want that you want to make sure that your guest has that experience. So it makes a cocktail more three dimensional, and it's the difference between a good drink and a great drink, in my opinion. Um, but it is very fleeting, so um, you want to make sure that that, that that is experienced by the guest, not by the, the, the server delivering the drink. So I'm going to make a few assumptions here um, when we're when we're talking about ice and and, and and shaking and all this stuff is that we have frozen glassware. Um, that's we have fresh ice that's not uh, sweaty, and then we're talking about a shaker full of ice. Uh, and I'm going to talk about relative shake times here because there are no, there are just so many variables when shaking that includes like ice quality, ice size, ice density, ambient temperature. Um, there's a million different factors. So at a certain point, you just kind of get to know your room and you can anticipate how long to shake. So I'm not going to tell you shake for, you know, I, I it actually drives me crazy when I see recipes that say shake for, um, you know, stir for this many rotations or shake for this many seconds. Um, it's all relative. Um, in the interest of rules and, 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 all, the, and all the cocktails have been, having already been built, um, room temperature cocktails should go up first. Uh, that's because you don't have, you have all the time in the world. Um, so um, uh, then you should go for the shaken or strain, uh, the, shake, the shaken, strained, and up or neat cocktails. Uh, so like your daiquiris. Um, the, uh, the, sh the shorter than that should be two, uh, two different uh, cocktails that have two different tins, uh, shaken or strained on a large block. And then shorter than that is shaken or topped with champagne. So you can always come back and do the champagne. Uh, shorter than that is drinks served on cold draft or similar dense ice, ice cubes like a gin and tonic vodka soda, short or collins. Shorter than that uh, should be um, something that's served with a dense uh, ice cube and topped with an effervescent like a French, like a uh, Collins. Um, and then shorter than that should be anything oh, served on pebble ice because the pebble ice has much more surface area. Now, um, the surface, the, 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 these whip shakes are meant to, when you're shaking with, with uh, pebble ice, it's just meant to kind of dilute it slightly because the ice delivering to the table is going to do all the work. And so that's why we call it kind of a whip, uh, whip, whip shake. Now, the second technique that I want to talk about is uh, straining. 
Now, straining is, uh, straining a cocktail is just as important as any of the other steps in making a cocktail, if not more. Um, a, w a very wise person uh, once told me that there are two things that you do slowly and deliberately, de deliberately measuring uh, and straining. And he also said, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And, uh, you know, I, that's an old military term for, that they use in sniper school, I think. So the reason you want to strain a shake and drink slowly is to allow the Hawthorne strainer to do its job and capture as much ice as possible because it broke apart when you shook it. Now, personally, um, I like to use a fine mesh strainer uh, whenever I shake with, my, with any ice other than block ice because um, my particular style and, and the, the texture that I was going for uh, required a very, very hard shake. I was a very hard shaker. Um, and so I, I would just turn, these ice, turn the ice into dust. Um, and, but what I wanted to see was the ice dust left at the top, uh, like in the tins, like a, like a fine strainer catches all the solids, um, a Hawthorne strainer can't. Uh, and um, now let's, uh, so, okay, so let's move on to stirring now. Um, stirring is basically the bookends of your rounds. By bookends, I mean like the beginning and end of your rounds. Um, so where you, where you start and where you finish, uh, the timing is absolutely crucial. If you don't stir long enough, there's not enough water. If you stir too long, drink is too wet, too diluted. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is all compounded by whether or not the drink um, is served on the ice or, or whether it's served up. Um, and so you kind of just have to do these mental, this mental calculus all the time, making sure that you're getting the drinks right. So um, what, uh, these factors, along with environmental considerations, like did the, did the air conditioner crap out? Or um, are you doing an event in the Sahara Desert? Um, yeah, these, these all factor in. So I just want to just do a quick note on, on double shaking. Um, du uh, so the only reason you would double shake is if you have, you know, definitely mastered the single shake with both hands. Um, you know, you don't want to be stronger in one hand than the other. So oftentimes people have a different shake when they double shake. And that's a problem because um, the same drink isn't going to come out from right hand to left hand. So um, you have to decide, like, is this, good rep is this a good representation of my skill? Um, so how does this technique represent your attention to detail in your finish or your prestige as the magician would call it. Um, so if you, I would only do this if you've mastered the shake in your less, less dominant hand by itself and then incorporate the other hand eventually. Um, like anything involving your weaker side, this will feel awkward in the beginning, like as in you, you know, using your right hand and left hand to pick up bottles. Um, but when your strength is up, um, this ability will pay dividends in, um, as far as efficiency is concerned. Now, not all drinks are meant to be shaken for the same length of time, in my opinion. Uh, and, and that depends on, on your recipe, your glassware, and a whole bunch of other factors. Uh, but what you want to go for is you want to make sure you get the same wash line every single time. So sometimes you're only shaking with a single piece of ice to chill, um, but not necessarily to dilute, as it um, usually is the case with cocktails served on crushed, cracked, or pebble ice. Um, now, you also want to keep in mind <clears throat> that with the large surface area, of these kinds of ice, um, you know, the, with, I'm talking about pebble ice, the, uh, the, the surface area is much larger and the dilution will happen in the drink's journey to the guest table. And um, there's a lot of other factors in that too, especially like when you're dealing with frozen glassware. Um, and this is mitigated by other factors such as uh, the temperature of the glass, the wetness of the ice, um, the distance of the travel to the guest. Like if you have to walk a mile, then the drink is gonna be wetter than when it started, obviously. Um, so this is, Another reason why ice is typically one of the very last elements in finishing around, is, at least as far as I'm concerned. Now, there is one notable exception to this um, that, I, that I can think of right now, and that is the julep. Um, so um, the, uh, with the julep, you want to uh, make sure that it's prepared ice, ice, ice cold, uh, and, uh, and then put it into the fridge. Like what we used to do is put it in the fridge or the freezer. We used to build it first, ice it, and then put, put it into the fridge or freezer so it would develop a nice frost on it. Um, another fun exception about this cocktail is it's one of the only ones that you can actually grab it by the glass, or we, we used to call this the Jersey Claw, where you grab a glass and <laughs> it's, it's gross, but you, it still happens. Um, all right, so let's talk about double straining for a second as well. Um, so this technique goes hand in hand with double, uh, uh, so um, this technique goes hand in hand with shaking, of course, um, but what I, what I do is shake both cocktails, um, assuming there's only one cocktail in each shaker, until they're individually close to done. Not completely done, but close to done. What, I'll, what I would do is I would set them both down and get them off the ice as fast as possible and into the appropriate glass. 
Um, uh, or I'm sorry, what I would do is I would finish the cocktails almost and then put them uh, on the ice, set them aside. And then when I was almost done, uh, I would, by the time it was, it was time to finish the, the entire round, I would give them a quick rattle and then strain them into the glasses. And that way, that way it kept them fresh. Um, but um, I was still kind of mentally timing the dilution. So when a drink is, sin is sitting in a tin after, after it's shaking, it's losing life rapidly. It's losing a lot of life um, second to second. To second. Um, so the best way to combat this is when shaking several different drinks is to keep your tins sealed and give them a quick rattle. When shaking several different drinks is to keep your tins sealed and give them a quick rattle like a um, to breathe new life uh, just before you're straining them. Uh, but you obviously want to be mindful of, of the initial shake because you don't want to have overshaken them and then give them uh, give them a rattle. So uh, a note about me, just a side note about me's here, um, when we have multiple tins and mixing glasses available, um, when you're done with the tin, discard it in the sink or get it out of the way um, because you can always clean it later, um, but you shouldn't worry about that in the middle of a round. The only focus should be on getting this round out perfectly and don't be distracted by dirty tools. Um, there will be time for that after the round is, is over. Um, towards the end of my time behind bars, I saw a lot of double straining, uh, qu double stirring, quadruple stirring. Um, now this, <laughs> this, uh, this is definitely a, a, pra a practice that you should master and, and, um, and uh, do that before service maybe. Uh, I remember trying this in, the, in service. I remember looking at the ticket and saying, yes, I can do four Negronis at the same time or whatever, like a Manhattan, a Negroni and a Martini at the same time. Um, and then I failed, I failed so bad. Um, and uh, so uh, just make sure you got this right because you don't want to distract people by, by messing up like that. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, the proof is always going to be in the wash line, but you know, in the case of like a Negroni, Martini, Manhattan, these all have different stir times. So um, make sure that you are mindful that, that your mind is on those, these three different elements um, and again, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Um, let the ice do the work. Um, okay, so, so this is the, the mother of, of this presentation is the build order. So as, start as, uh, as the orders start to come in, it's time to start thinking about what we call stacking orders. Um, this technique was um, essential to, um, to uh, efficiency when a large volume of orders started coming in all at once. You had to be mindful of multiple tickets. You didn't work on one ticket at a time, you worked on multiple tickets at a time. Uh, the name of the game is getting tickets out fast and in and perfectly and making sure that everything is perfect. So drinks that are made well taste good. Drinks that come out good and fast taste great. Uh, so um, people were not particularly patient in New York. So the actual order that um, the tickets arrive is not nearly as important as the efficiency that you use to execute, but only if there's or efficiency needs to be had. So you don't want to force it. Um, if you're uh, if you see the same drink on two tickets, build them both in the same tin. Uh, this is okay because especially if they're on the ice. So this should not be um, at the expense of the larger ticket, however. Um, so for instance, if you see a four top that, that ordered a Manhattan, a margarita, a beer, a vodka soda, um, and you see another ticket for a, for a single margarita, then by all means, double up that margarita and serve them both and get two tickets, get two tickets out at the same time. You can add ice if, uh, you can add ice to the, to the margarita, margarita later, uh, but you're still killing um, two birds with one stone. Now get the short, easy drinks out first. Um, and remember ice always comes last. So vodka soda, you, you order a vodka soda, a beer or a glass of wine, um, you know, you're first in line typically. Uh, it's okay to scan these because that one impact on that one guest is, um, you know, getting their drink in three minutes is, is going to be a very positive sign. So the, the, the first step in building rounds is the receiving order. And this is where you take a second to internalize the ticket, um, visualize how you're going to light it up, uh, like, and visualize it. It's slow. Um, it, when it's slow, it's a, it's a great time to practice this. So think about how many times you actually need to pick up a bottle. So visualize the entire round in your head. Um, uh, does the lime juice go in more than one drink? Is there the same bourbon in two drinks? Um, so once you know your tickets, um, and once you know your ticket and then eventually tickets, um, you set it aside for reference in case you need it. But um, the, the mastery of this is when you remember, um, remember all the orders. And it's, you know, it's easier said than done, obviously. But uh, it's better to get the round right than to have to make it over. So if you need to reference the ticket, reference the ticket. So if you're working with frozen or, or chilled glassware, this, is a, uh, this adds another layer to the mental game. Now, I didn't like to pull my, my glasses out of the freezer 
um, to warm up to room temperature um, uh, because I thought that um, you know that was a, that was part of the temperature of the drink, and so I was waited to the absolute last second to pull out the glassware. Uh, now, uh, the order that I would deliver cocktails would be um, neat pours, um, I would, shots. If they're shots, I would get rid of those immediately. Um, anything that's muddled uh, comes next. Um, and, and what I used to do is set up a placeholder shaker and then put the fruit in there so and, and without muddling. Um, and then, uh, then would come the blended drinks and then came the stirred down drinks, stirred up drinks, shaken down drinks, drinks on the rocks, uh, shaken with an effervescent, shaken up. Uh, shaken up drinks, um, uh, um, then I would muddle the cocktails, uh, then I would swizzle, then I would build the cocktails, the one-on-one, -on -one, the highballs, then I would make the glass of wine, the beer, um, and then I would top everything with the effervescence, whether it's soda or champagne, and then, um, uh, and then I would do, if we had draft beer, I'd do a draft beer after that, because that um, has, has, has the most deterioration. So um, that's a lot, but uh, let's talk about quality control for a second. Now, everybody makes mistakes. Um, this is, uh, when you think about it, we're making millions of calculations in our head. So when we're internalizing this method, um, it's going to ha happen a lot that we make mistakes. My advice is to mentally walk through the rounds uh, with a coworker before using live bottles. You can say, what if? Uh, think of this as like kind of push-ups for your brain. But if you say, hey, I got this, this, I got a Margarita, Manhattan, Col Tom Collins, and a gin and tonic. What's your order? Uh, so it's hard enough for cocktail bars to make money without having to comp drinks that weren't made properly or took forever. So... Um, do this verbally and um, then run your mind through it and then it, it gets easier and easier and easier. So practice this, visualization, uh, pr practice this visualization and it will get much, much, much easier. Um, and then uh, what your mind uh, knows, your body will follow. Um, and so drill yourself, drill your team, work with each other. And um, you know, this is a great way to learn menus as well. Um, so uh, you, know, you, can you can incrementally grow with this as well. So you start with one drink, then you start with two drinks, then you start with three drinks, and then four drinks, and then up to eight, 10 drinks, whatever we, whatever your mind can handle. Um, you know, again, this is a great way to learn uh, a new menu or to learn classic specs. So, um, you know, once you're kind of at this point, we were able to create four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 drinks, um, just mentally in your mind, uh, then you're just a complete ninja and a badass and you can work in any bar that I've ever worked in. So, um, you know, uh, I miss rematch by the way. Rematch was fun. So um, we talked about Mise en Plus. Um, now, can we see the parallels between Mise en Plus and your life? Um, so Mise en Plus and workflow um, are, are, they go very much hand in hand. Now, if you think about it, um, you know, at Death & Co, we would routinely show up uh, at least an hour or two before work to make our own syrups, to cut garnishes, to set up our Mise. Um, and the, the the point of this is that um, without preparation, there's rarely high performance. Um, so how do we set ourselves up like we set up our bars? Um, now, just here are a couple of ideas and thoughts. Um, but we, um, we plan our, like, I like to plan my day to minimize decisions and prepare elements of, our, uh, of my life before I need it so I can, um, so it's on standby for when I do need it. Uh, now, um, I like to create an optimal environment for performance by eliminating distractions and eliminating the need for decisions. Um, it, it, it could be, uh, in, in, this could be in the physical world, of course, but what really matters is what happens in your mind. Now, think about how many decisions you make in a day. Um, this, just think about it, it's, it's a lot. So it's like, what time am I gonna wake up? What time am I gonna go to bed? What am I gonna wear today? What am I going to do today? What am I going to eat? Uh, what appointments am I going to go to? Um, how am I going to, you know, achieve my goals? Whatever it is, um, each of these things is a little decision, and it adds up to um, and compounds to what ultimately becomes what is known as decision fatigue. So when we're setting up our mees, uh, we eliminate having to make decisions because the, the lime juice is always exactly where the lime juice is. Uh, but we literally get tired of making decisions. So um, too many having to make too many decisions actually impacts our ability to make good decisions. Um, and so if we take a few simple steps to reduce the, the number of decisions that we make, we preserve the bandwidth necessary to focus on what really actually matters in our lives. And so th um, again, this is, think about this when you're talking about how your bar is set up, like we eliminate decisions all the time. Uh, so we have to, we have a certain amount of, of, of cares to give um, in any one day before we sleep and reset. So, 
it's important to judiciously use the, this amount of bandwidth for what is uh, for what's important. So this is exactly what we do when we're setting up our bars. We design the most efficient and effective way to solve complex problems, e.g. Um, a, a complex cocktail and making many of them. So a common myth is that our, 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 our sapient brains are good at multitasking. But the truth is we're not good at multitasking. We're good at switching, uh, but we're not great at, at, at doing um, multiple things at the same time. We can, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, but just not very well. Uh, but reality, um, so we may call it multitasking, but it's actually just um, managing distractions. And so if we're able to focus um, on the, the most important things and we can be effective at, the, at that one thing at a time. Um, this is not me making this up, this is science. Um, so by mastering one thing at a time with intention, uh, we become machines of simple movements. And um, you know, uh, remember we're talking about slow is smooth, smooth is fast. We're just, um, we're just a few, like, here are just a few ways we can apply these principles to our lives. So one thing that I do is, uh, it, it, uh, it would drive some people crazy, but I do use time blocking. And so every hour of my day is blocked off to, um, to, to certain tasks that I like to do based on when I'm creative or when I think I'm going to be tired, when I need more, more the most energy. Um, and I plan out my daily routine uh, starting from the day before. Now, routine is, a, routine is a big, big deal for us. Routine and ritual are big, big deals for humans. So um, I actually set an alarm for what time it's supposed to go, what time I'm supposed to go to bed. Uh, uh, not, and not for when I'm supposed to wake up, but when I'm supposed to go to bed. Um, some people wouldn't prefer both, but, um, I used to have, uh, four daily alarms to get my mindset, my, to, my, to get my mindset on what I needed to focus on to prepare for what I knew was what I wanted to accomplish. So, um, you know, if I wanted to work out the next morning, I would set out my clothes, uh, my workout clothes, um, ready. So I didn't have to decide what I was going to wear in the morning because that would create a barrier. Um, and it created additional steps in, in between me doing what I knew I needed to do and, and actually doing it. So I would eliminate that by just saying, here are my, my clothes, here's my water bottle, everything is, is, is all set for me to go. Um, another big thing is uh, tidying up. Being tidy in your life is, is um, uh, we don't understand that, that like, having stuff around and like clutter is very stressful. Now, um, you know, all the stuff I'm talking about may sound like, like I'm kind of creating stress, but it, it really is in line with, um, with one of the paradoxes of, of modern civilization. Um, you know, we need order to be free. Um, by creating processes and routines, we create habits that allow us to be the people that we want to be. Uh, and, you know, I'm not talking about the, you know, airbrushed, faked people that we see on TV. Um, you know, I'm talking about like, you know, being polished person and happy person yourself. So I'm talking about being available to be a real contributor to our families, um, our crafts and our community. Uh, and this doesn't happen when we waste a lot of time looking for our keys. Um, stress kills more people than cancer. Um, so by arranging our workspaces, our businesses, our minds, our drop boxes, our email inboxes, our, our relationships, our kids, our lives in a way that reduces drag and friction, we actually enrich ourselves by allowing joy and happiness to enter. Now, I'm not trying to say I'm like the Dalai Lama here. Uh, this is absolutely a work in progress, but um, I, I absolutely believe it. So my question is, what would you be willing to do to be happy? And I would suggest try visualizing the perfect round. This will get you closer to visualizing the perfect day. Um, so uh, if you'd like to discuss these ideas further, um, please be sure to connect with me on the Global Bar Week portal, um, or you can find me anywhere on the internet at Jason Luttrell. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for checking out this presentation, and I hope it was a good use of your time. Thank you.